Next, a panel of historians talks about espionage tactics used from the Cold War to post 9-11. They discuss techniques and human intelligence gathering by the CIA and Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, as well as the shift in intelligence methods after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The New York Military Affairs Symposium in New York City hosted this two-hour-long event. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to um, ailing but here, bright and lively, is the publisher of Enigma Books and the executive director of NIMAS, Mr. Robert Miller. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was very sad to hear about the passing of uh, Bob Manis. I just uh, was uh, shocked by the news, and I wish we could have this information earlier on our, our website. So I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this two-day event on espionage from the Cold War to asymmetric warfare. I shall first offer a few words of introduction, followed by a very brief presentation of our panel. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the 9-11 attacks on New York, the American public has never been so thoroughly informed of the successes and failures of its espionage services. Starting with the crumbling of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, and the disclosure in the mid-1990s of the now famous Venona decrypts, there was ample reason to congratulate both FBI and CIA for a job well done. By 1945, American cryptographers had broken the Soviet codes at Arlington Hall, the Washington, D.C. campus where the secret work took place, and proof of, vast, of the vast amount of Soviet spying that had been long suspected was confirmed. The victory over communism came with the vindication of our intelligence organizations. But then, the new open Russia suddenly closed its archives with the ascent of a former KGB officer named Vladimir Putin to the presidency of that country in 1999, ending a short window of transparency and cooperation among historians. Just a year and a half later, the greatest shock troubled the newfound satisfaction in our security apparatus with the September 11, 2001 destruction that took place in this city. The media taught us all about connecting dots and that FBI and CIA were actually suddenly dysfunctional since we had been caught sleeping at the wheel just like at Pearl Harbor in 1941. In a rush to fix things, a vast new bureaucracy was erected with homeland security, and a vast re-engineering took place within the traditional agencies. For obvious reasons, we can't tell how successful those initiatives have been. We can only agree that the absence of major attacks in this country on the scale of 9-11, and the assurances of congressional committee members who offer, the, that are offered periodically are meant to be reassuring. Finally, the question we have for this panel and for the audience that will participate in the debate is simply, are we better off now than before? How do the services measure up to the challenges offered by Islamic terrorism a Russia that seems to live in a new Cold War, the leaking of vast amounts of secret documents uh, by improperly vetted military or government employees. I am referring to WikiLeaks and perhaps to the Panama Papers. What do we know? What we do know is that major destruction can be the work of very few determined individuals who carry out a specific plan. Is the United States better off today than it was in the 1990s? Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. Dr. Mark Kramer is the Director of Cold War Studies at Harvard University and a Senior Fellow of Harvard Davis Center for uh, Russian and Eurasian Studies. 
He is the author of Imposing, Maintaining, and Tearing Open the Iron Curtain, the Cold War, and East Central Europe, 1945-1990, published in 2013. He is also the editor of a three-volume collection, The Fate of the Communist Regimes, 1989-1991, to be published in late 2016. Dr. Joseph Fitsanakis, who received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh, and built the Security and Intelligence Studies program at King University, has taught and written extensively on the subjects such as international espionage, intelligence tradecraft, wiretapping, cyber espionage, transnational crime, and intelligence reform. He's a frequent contributor to the news media such as BBC, CBS, ABC, and NPR. Mark Mazzetti has reported extensively from Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Horn of Africa for the New York Times on national security. He holds a master's in history from Oxford University and is the author of The Way of the Knife, published by Penguin in 2013, a best-selling account of the CIA's covert action forces. Please welcome our panel and And I, I give the podium to Dr. Mark Kramer. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, I am just waiting for a PowerPoint presentation to be put up here. Um, I should add, the, uh, I, it wasn't mentioned in the brief biographical sketch, but something I realized afterward is, uh, pr especially germane to tonight's symposium, is I'm also the editor of a book put out by MIT Press called Spies, um, and it is a collection of essays about Cold War spying, the, the uh, topic of tonight. I also just was in Russia. I was there um, from the mid-April until about uh, 24 hours ago and um, have worked extensively in the archives there many times, including this most recent trip. The, um, as I'll get to in a minute, the political situation in Russia is dismal, as everyone knows, because Putin has reimposed essentially an authoritarian system. The good news is, though, that it has not affected the archives. And in fact, if anything, bizarrely, or paradoxically, the, that archival access has actually improved over the last couple of years, particularly the last year. And I'll be referring to that a bit in tonight's, um, in the comments here. Um, okay, that's all right. I did bring my computer with the presentation in case this doesn't work. Um, the, uh, the structure of what I will be presenting is first to go through some of the newly available sources just to give a sense of what actually is available now. There is an, an, so much more that is available as compared to the situation during the Cold War. And I just want to highlight that because it's not only from Russia but also from other former uh, worser pact countries and from Western countries as well. And um, one of those sources which Robert Miller mentioned was is the Venona Papers. Okay, so so okay, good. So the uh, first, I'll go through some of the newly available sources, then to talk about some of the uh, activities. Then, uh, whoops, I actually wanted to move it here. Is, um, the, uh, then I'll talk both about intelligence gathering activities of different types and then uh, other activities. Tomorrow I'll come to questions of the impact on policy making and impact on the Cold War. Um, I may get into a little of that tonight, but I want to reserve most of it for tomorrow. So let me uh, go through some of the newly available sources so far. The uh, documents from East European state security archives in, uh, in some cases are fully open. So you have access to foreign intelligence materials of the Warsaw Pact, including a lot of Soviet documents, copies of which were sent there. And in 
Germany, former East Germany, the Bundesbetrachter that over the um, federal commissioner that oversees the former state security archive. The intelligence uh, files are not completely open. There are a few that aren't, um, few areas that aren't, but by and large they're fully open. In the Czech Republic under legislation adopted in 2004, the records of the former state security apparatus, including the foreign intelligence apparatus, are fully accessible. Poland is uh, somewhat um, not as accessible, but a, a great deal of the foreign intelligence uh, files of the communist regime are accessible. They're under the auspices of the Institute of National uh, Remembrance, as it's called, IPN. Uh, that, there is a separate archive of the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Poland, but the communist era records by and large now are housed at the IPN, which does have a central archive you can go to and work in. The, uh, in Hungary, it has been, um, it has varied somewhat over the post-communist period, but at the former state security archive, there, uh, there is a considerable amount that is accessible. Bulgaria, you might be surprised by, but in um, 2006, there was a commission set up, Comdos, and that uh, commission oversees the security records of the communist regime, including foreign intelligence. They have made vast amounts of the, uh, of the collections they have available online. You can go online and download tens of thousands of documents. They also, if you go there and work, you can actually work there even though you have to do, it's a somewhat cumbersome process, but you are able to get access to, to very important materials of the Foreign Intelligence Service in Bulgaria. It, all of these are important records because they worked very closely under the supervision of the Soviet KGB's foreign intelligence apparatus. And so not only are those records valuable in, them, in themselves, but you can also find their copies of Soviet foreign intelligence documents. The, um, in addition, in the former Soviet Union outside Russia, for example, in the Baltic uh, countries, this would be Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, there are uh, foreign intelligence records, even though they were not, they were Soviet republics, and were not the central archive. There were uh, quite a few copies of central foreign intelligence documents from the KGB that you can find there, particularly in Lithuania and Estonia, which uh, have separate KGB archives. In Latvia, it's merged within the um, central state archive and is not, um, it, there was more destruction of material there in the final months of the Soviet regime than in Lithuania and Estonia. But you can find very useful materials in all three countries, foreign intelligence records of the Soviet regime. Then uh, in, in Russia, the foreign intelligence archive, which is in in the uh, outskirts of Moscow in Yasenova. It, it used to be in the Lubyanka, the main uh, NKVD and then KGB building that is in central Moscow. But it w in 1974, it was moved out to Yasenova, the whole foreign intelligence apparatus. It was still part of the KGB, the first main directorate of the KGB, but it was moved out there and so was the archive. That archive has been um, inaccessible throughout the post-Soviet period. I asked one time, I was at a conference where the head of that archive took part, and I asked him when the archive might be at least partly accessible. He responded, nikagda, which means never. Um, so I think that there is relatively little hope she would have some change of, uh, to a democratic government in Russia of having some access there. However, um, the good news is that there are a lot of copies of important records that you can find in archives that are at least partly accessible. In, um, for example, in the uh, early post-Soviet period, 1992, there was a trial of the 
uh, Soviet Communist Party. It didn't result in anything. But in connection with that, the, uh, there was a special commission set up to investigate files of the KGB, among other organs of the Soviet regime. And those, uh, the things they looked at and collected were eventually made available in what is now Fond 89 of an archive that's now known as Regani, the Russian state archive of recent history. And that, that is not only accessible in Russia, it's also, it was microfilmed in total. And the uh, microfilms are readily available at, at uh, many university libraries, also New York Public Library and others. So if you're interested in looking at those, you can find the records, many KGB records. They are including important things pertaining to covert operations, among other things, uh, KGB covert operations. The, uh, there are also important KGB foreign intelligence documents stored in other parts of Rigani, that same archive. That would include now files of various departments of the Communist Party's Central Committee. Those uh, were off limits for quite a while, but they were opened last August. And so it, the irony of the situation in Russia is that archival access, fortunately, has not corresponded to the degree of uh, political liberalization in Russia. That, um, for reasons that I uh, we can get into later, if anyone's interested, it hasn't been that way. It's it's operated quite independently of that. The um, there are also other archives where you can find important records from uh, Soviet foreign intelligence apparatus. This would include what is now called Rigaspi, the Russian State Archive of Social Political History. It's the former Central Party Archive. It covers the Stalin period, based Lenin and Stalin period. So if you're interested in Stalin era, um, intelligence activities, you can find copies of some doc, including important documents. They are very important documents there. The, um, it also, that archive houses the records of the former Comintern, which played an important role in Soviet espionage. There is, is a very good book available about that um, by John Earl Haynes and Harvey Clare, who are two prominent specialists on Soviet era espionage in the United States. And uh, their book is, their first book on that topic is based on the common turn files of the American Communist Party that's housed there. The, um, the State Archive of the Russian Federation, or GARF, also has important materials pertaining to so Soviet foreign intelligence. These were um, partly as a result of just record keeping. The files of the Soviet state security apparatus were under the auspices of the Ministry of Internal Affairs from during the 1950s. That, that ended in 1960, but you can find those records now housed at GARF. In fact, they were um, specially uh, digitized and it's pretty easy to go through them. Um, GARF is one of the most open of the Russian archives, but all of the ones I've referred to here are pretty easy to work in now, even though at various times in the post-Soviet period they haven't been. The, then there is the archive of the Russian Foreign Ministry, um, the, archive of, uh, the archive of the foreign policy of the Russian Federation, as it's known. And the, um, that archive, can, again, contains important materials that the foreign ministry was using from the KGB, as well as the uh, foreign ministry the Soviet foreign ministry played an important role in its own right in Soviet espionage. It had the diplomatic service of the, foreign the Soviet foreign ministry had a supplementary um, rationale of being a, uh, a kind of supplement to the foreign intelligence service. Then it, other important materials are available in the Mitrochin transcripts and summaries. These uh, were 
transcripts of documents done by Vasily Mitrokhin. He was the KGB archivist in the, for, or the foreign intelligence archive, the archivist there from the uh, early 70s until about 1983. These records were transferred. They were initially offered to the United States, the US government. Um, Feel the unwise decision turned them down, uh, thinking they weren't serious. And um, fortunately, the British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, was more uh, observant and realized the great value of these materials. They, um, the materials, unfortunately, SIS kept them off limits for 20 odd years. And fortunately, though, they are now fully accessible at. Churchill College, Cambridge, in, in Cambridge, England. And uh, they were made accessible there in the summer of 2014, after being off limits for about 22 years. The uh, records are, you are allowed to use a digital camera there, and so if, for example, you're interested in looking at the records he transcribed from uh, pertaining to espionage in the United States, you can do that. Those are in volumes. I did uh, photograph all of those. The, uh, there are records pertaining to most parts of the world. So those are, um, had been earlier summarized in two important books put out by Mitrokhin and Christopher Andrew. Christopher Andrew, the intelligence histori British intelligence historian. And for the most part, um, they quite accurately reflect the content of the documents, but um, there are many, many things they weren't able to include in those two volumes, and there's at least one discre important discrepancy I found when actually going through the materials. The um, Mitrokhin transcripts cover the full Soviet period, but are predominantly about the 70s and early 80s. There is relatively little there about the Stalin period. There are a few uh, very interesting things, but um, much less about the Stalin period than I had thought there might be. There is also uh, a good deal less about the 50s and early 60s. As you move into the 60s, it increases, but particularly as in the set, the large majority of it deals with the 70s and, and early 80s. So you can find very important things there. The um, Alexander Vasilyev is another former uh, KGB foreign intelligence officer. He was working on a project um, for what the book that came out as The Haunted Wood, which was co he and the late uh, Alan Weinstein co-authored. It came out, I think, in 1997 or 98. That book dealt with Soviet espionage in the United States during the Stalin era. And that book also um, was able to deal with only a very small portion of what Vasilyev actually transcribed. He was allowed to work in a room where archivists from the Foreign Intelligence Archive brought him materials. And those materials were, uh, again, focused on the United States. Vasilyev was not an expert on foreign espionage in the United States, so when he, the, which is good, because it meant that he erred on the side of copying a great deal. So he would transcribe entire documents and you can find um, extremely interesting things about Soviet foreign espionage in the United States. The, um, the materials, again, because of uh, John Earl Haynes and Harvey Clare, who worked with Vasilyev, I myself also worked with him in 2009. And the materials were transferred to the Woodrow Wilson Center archive, uh, which is um, in conjunction with a project known as the Cold War International History Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC. That project has been invaluable in making materials available from former communist countries, including Russia. And the Matrokin transcripts were digitized, they were translated, and all of those are available online. So you can find uh, translations of them if you want to look at the original 
transcriptions as well as because um, they were done by hand and then he typed them out in Russian and then you can look at the translations. All three versions are fully accessible. The um, Vasiliev's notebooks are a complement to, and an extraordinarily valuable complement to the Venona papers that uh, Robert Miller mentioned. And the Venona papers were decrypted over a, quite a long period by what is now known as the National Security Agency. It became the National Security Agency in 1952. The, uh, National Security Agency and its various incarnations um, was decrypting these going back to the late wartime years, but then uh, really had key breakthroughs after the war, even though the, the, in, these are intercepted NKVD documents to various parts of the world, including the United States. And the major decryptions came in the late 40s and into the 50s, and they continued to um, decrypt them even into the 70s, and eventually the project was halted. They're, they realized that at a certain point, um, they wouldn't be able to decrypt more of them. They were extremely difficult to decrypt, and it was only through the ingenuity, because this was uh, at a time when computers were relatively primitive. Um, and so most of this was done through human ingenuity of NSA code breakers. And the, um, it's, it's quite a stunning thing that they were able to decrypt any of them, because the Soviet decrypts used a particular feature that made it essentially impossible to decrypt them. But the, uh, there was a flaw introduced into it in, um, in, in the early, just after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in uh, 1941. And as a result of that, a lot of them used a particular one-time pad, as it was known, that in fact was dupli uh, duplicated. And so they were able to, upon detecting that, to break the codes and to be able to read them. So the uh, Vasiliev notebooks overlap with the Venona papers, but are an invaluable supplement to them because they um, really fill in a lot of gaps for each other, all dealing with uh, Soviet intelligence in the United States, in the case of Vasiliev, and in the case of the Venona papers, also dealing with Soviet foreign intelligence elsewhere. The, um, then there are documents from uh, East European spies who were working for the CIA or for British intelligence. Uh, Kuklinski, Richard Kuklinski was a spy uh, for the, or he was an intelligence source for the CIA from 1972 until November 1981 when he had to flee Poland because he had been discovered there and was on the verge of being arrested. The, there is uh, extremely um, quite a startling account of how he got out of Poland in a book by Benjamin uh, Weiser, who's a uh, New York Times reporter, or at least used to be. I, he also at that time was working for the Washington Post. But the, um, uh, in his book about Kuklinski, which came out in 2004, you can find an account of how he got out. Prior to his getting out, though, he was able to transfer to the CIA copies of tens of thousands of documents. Um, a, good, uh, a good deal of the materials he smuggled out, though by no means all, um, were made available by the CIA about uh, six year, uh, seven years ago. And there was a, a symposium that was held in Washington, D.C. in conjunction with that. And, that, and then uh, all of the materials eventually were put online. So if you go to CIA's extremely useful uh, f uh, electronic reading room, www.foia.cia.gov, you can uh, find the Kuglinski documents among many others. I'll get to some of the others in a minute. The, um, there are also documents that U.S. forces involved in operations in the Middle East or other forces involved in operations in the Middle East, especially um, Israel and uh, US, U.S. personnel in Africa and Latin America 
were able to acquire at various points. And a lot of these, by no means all, are now also available. The Middle East ones in particular, the ones from Iraq that were captured by US forces, because these are difficult to work with, even if you know Arabic, they're often difficult to work with. But they have been gradually, they're in three separate locations as well. And the, uh, there are a good deal of them that are now being made available in translation. And so if you're interested in that aspect of intelligence, particularly Saddam Hussein's foreign intelligence apparatus, you can find a good deal because, again, it had close ties with Soviet Union. The, um, uh, there are also now vast quantities of declassified CIA documents. And again, it's hard to overstate what a change the end of the Cold War made, that there are just um, endless collections of CIA materials you can find on that website that I mentioned, the electronic reading room. These were kept off limits during the Cold War, but um, again, one of the uh, beneficial aspects of the end of the Cold War is that it did uh, inspire the CIA to agree to release um, large, large chunks of its Cold War uh, collections. It, um, covert operations are still difficult, and there is still um, a great deal of effort being made, so far for the most part unsuccessfully, but to uh, it, secure a greater release of covert uh, materials pertaining to go covert operations, but the intelligence gathering and the the uh, I, I'm sorry the analysis part of the CIA the, um, the analytical division uh, a great deal of those are now accessible and are often extremely interesting sometimes wrong about things. Um, if you look, are able to compare it with some of the Soviet records, you can see they got some things wrong, but they also often did an extremely good job and got things uh, pretty accurate and did um, a lot of benefit to U.S. policymakers who wanted to understand what was going on. Then there are memoirs by former East European intelligence officers and by former Soviet intelligence officers. Uh, the memoirs always you have to be wary of because not only are memoirs just by their genre bound to be self-serving to a degree, but the, uh, they also, most of these people did not want to disclose too much. And in some cases, they may actually dissemble and, and to try to mislead people. So you have to be very cautious when using these, but they still are often extremely important sources about uh, key records, including uh, um, f former intelligence officers in the Soviet bloc who genuinely wanted to disclose what had happened and the sorts of things they were involved in and what their countries had been involved in. The, there are also important uh, memoirs by Western intelligence officers, including some former directors like Robert Gates, who wrote an interesting memoir that came out in uh, mid-1990s. And there are others who have written um, other former senior CIA personnel, and in some cases not so former, uh, not so senior personnel who have written interesting and useful memoirs. Again, with the same caveats, that you do have to remember that most of them, they, they are under legal obligation not to disclose classified information. The, uh, so let me then, um, just to finish to, uh, tonight's presentation, just by going through a little bit about what we know with regard to the Soviet foreign intelligence apparatus. I'm not going to deal as much now with the uh, US intelligence apparatus because in part because my colleagues will be, or at least Mark Mazzetti will be dealing with that about current day. It hasn't changed drastically in the uh, post-Cold War period. Its focus has, it's no longer on the Soviet Union, um, which doesn't exist. But in, in some of the 
um, entities of it have been renamed, including several times. Um, I don't even recall what used to be called the operations director of the CIA and then became the National Clandestine Service. I know it was recently renamed, but I don't recall exactly what. Um, the, uh, so in the case of the Soviet bloc, though, the 11th Department of the Soviet KGB's first main directorate oversaw the various Warsaw Pact, um, the various Warsaw Pact foreign intelligence services. The first main directorate of the uh, KGB was the foreign intelligence apparatus. Its jurisdiction shifted over time. Um, during the Stalin era, at one point it had been under the foreign ministry, and at another time it had been under what is called what was called the NKVD or the Ministry of Internal, the uh, People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. The the um, but the, the uh, first main directorate from the time the KGB was created in 1954 through the end of the Soviet regime had an 11th department that oversaw the Warsaw Pact foreign intelligence. There were Soviet KGB so-called advisors, intelligence officers, and intelligence operational groups stationed with East European foreign intelligence services. And their upkeep was funded by the East European governments, the Warsaw Pact governments, until 1990. So those record, the um, records there are, again, you can find many of those in the East European archives and the uh, former Warsaw Pact countries archives and shed a great deal of light on the structures and policy making portion of the foreign intelligence service itself. The, um, by far the bulk of the Soviet and East European state security uh, organs' efforts were directed at domestic intelligence, roughly 85% of personnel in most cases. So internal security was the primary uh, orientation. And it's not surprising because these were large state security apparatuses and overseeing modern countries was a difficult thing. The, um, the 15 percent or so of personnel that worked in foreign intelligence, the foreign intelligence service, had special training to allow them to serve there. And as uh, Robert Miller mentioned, one of such um, officer was Vladimir Putin. Um, the sheer size of the Warsaw Pact state security organs meant that they had very large, aggressive foreign intelligence branches. And above all, the Soviet KGB, but in the case of all of the others that I've discussed here, you can find similar that they similarly had very active foreign intelligence operations. They were, uh, took this mission seriously. So, um, and then finally, let me mention the, uh, for tonight's um, session is, the Soviet and East European uh, foreign intelligence forces had a good deal of joint efforts during the Cold War. There was an increasing centralization of efforts under Soviet Warsaw Pact structures in the 1970s and 1980s. This corresponded as well to an increasing centralization of Warsaw Pact structures in the military sphere, but that was true equally in the foreign intelligence sphere. The foreign intelligence services of the Warsaw Pact countries were under this 11th department of the, uh, the, the uh, 11th directorate of the KGB's first main directorate. And the, uh, those structures were increasingly under Soviet control through changes enacted in the Warsaw Pact's statutes. Formal leadership organs were established um, in all cases in the 1970s, even, even to an extent earlier, but by the 1970s, it was heavily centralized. There were specific cooperation agreements in addition. These were 
bilateral for the most part. There were multilateral agreements, but they were largely bilateral and they were updated periodically. Again, bringing foreign intelligence increasingly under Soviet control. So you can understand what Soviet priorities were if you look at the records of the uh, East European Foreign Intelligence Services. There, were the, uh, there was also, beyond the formal agreements, there was informal cooperation and allocation of assignments. For example, it's now known that uh, the Bulgarian state security apparatus, the, uh, it, w it was called the Dojavna Seguna, or state security, had a 12th department that was responsible for assassinations overseas. Um, and a question I'm often asked is whether Bulgaria was involved in the attempted assassination on the Pope. Um, I won't get into that now. I'll talk a little bit about that maybe tomorrow. <laughs> the um, the uh, informal cooperation particularly applied to things uh, like covert operations, but it also in some cases involved intelligence gathering. The, uh, there was an allocation of assignments among the Warsaw Pact countries. Cooperation, the only exception to what I've mentioned here is Romania. The cooperation between the Soviet and Romanian foreign int intelligence agencies greatly diminished in the mid-1960s. This was a conscious decision of Ceausescu's uh, regime in Romania. It wanted to establish autonomy for Romania, not independence, but autonomy for Romania in both the military and foreign intelligence spheres. It never disappeared entirely. For example, Romania was involved in covert operations in which it worked closely with the Soviet and other East European agencies. This included the bombing of the Radio Free Europe headquarters in Munich. And, um, but also Romania had close involvement with uh, t terrorists, especially in the Middle East, um, in some cases also in Western Europe. The, um, so the Romanian Foreign Intelligence Service continued to play an important role. It's just it was much less under Soviet auspices. It worked sometimes in conjunction with the other bloc intelligence services, but uh, separately. The, and then finally, the roles and missions of individual East European intelligence services varied some depending on what their area of expertise was. For example, the East German state security apparatus had the great benefit of knowing or speaking German as a native language. So that made it quite easy to penetrate West Germany. The uh, West Germany, in addition, gave an en route in the, and uh, allowed uh, entree to the uh, NATO headquarters. And so in the um, East German state security apparatus, I'll discuss this a little tomorrow, in the East German state security apparatus files, you can find uh, large quantities of classified NATO and West German documents. In fact, there are so many of them, you can see, that, and, and you can track when they were supplied. In some cases, almost on the same day they were produced. Um, in many cases, within a few days. So the East German uh, state security apparatus had direct entree to important classified materials of the West. The, um, this meant that uh, in some cases, and I'll get to this tomorrow, you could argue that it may have actually had a stabilizing role because of what it showed about NATO's intentions, that NATO, for example, was a defensive alliance. The, um, so they, East Germany would probably be the easiest to point to in a specialty, but there were other missions, for example, Bulgaria, again, the um, important state security service in Bulgaria had a role in the Balkans in uh, overseeing efforts there. There were two Balkan countries that were members of NATO from 1952 on, uh, 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 Greece and Turkey. And so Bulgaria was able to, and Bulgaria has a large ethnic um, Turkish community, 
and so was able to draw on that in part to deal with Turkey and similarly with Greece. So the, um, the Polish uh, uh, foreign intelligence services likewise had, um, particularly to try to deal with some Polish emigres if they were able to turn them, or to use um, Polish scholars in the West um, I have found, for example, a very interesting report produced by the, Pol or not interesting, interesting in a perverse way, um, of the Polish Foreign Intelligence Service from November 1968 about the service that is now called, uh, the uh, entity of Harvard that is now called the Davis Center where I um, have an office and uh, that center was then called the Russian Research Center and they clearly had someone from the Polish uh, scholarly community who was supplying information. It's quite an accurate report. Unfortunately, because Poland at the time was in the throes of an anti-Semitic campaign, it talks about how many Jews there were in the, uh, at, at Harvard and particularly at that center. I translated the report and you can find it um, online on the Davis Center website. So with that, I will finish for tonight's session and we'll look forward to speaking with you tomorrow. So I have the, um, the non-PowerPoint interlude for the evening. Um, and so you'll just have to hear me and, and uh, be captivated just by my voice and not by, and I'll be, my nephew just arrived, so I'll be keeping an eye on him. <laughs> if, he, if, I, if I keep his attention, I figure I'm doing okay. Um, but uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me here at the symposium. It's a, it's a terrific honor being on this panel. And, um, and being back up in New York, um, a city I've spent a lot of time in, and it's always great to be back in. And I was feeling a little jealous listening to the previous presentation, Mark's presentation, because uh, the, the, the idea of going through all these terrific archives and seeing all of this information that's been either declassified or, or officially released uh, is something that a journalist who's toiling away in this current era could only dream about. Um, we have to deal with uh, the memories of officers. Uh, you have to deal with, uh, Mark mentioned, memoirs that uh, I agree are imprecise or self-serving. You have to deal with getting information from people who are always under the threat of going to jail for talking to you. And it makes it very difficult um, to to do this kind of work in this in this period when people are going to jail. But I do think it's also very important. And when Robert talked about the some of these mass disclosures of classified documents, I should say that as a reporter, um, I am wholly endorsing uh, mass disclosures of classified documents, um, as long as uh, we at the New York Times get to look at them first and decide what we should publish. Um, and, uh, but it is, it is difficult, and I, 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 I look forward to, I don't know if I look forward to this, you know, all the documents uh, coming out from this period 40 years from now, and I can find out everything I got wrong. Uh, but um, I wanted to talk uh, tonight about the uh, it's a good segue. It's the, 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 the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the 9-11 period uh, and, and really what I argue are the dramatic changes that have taken place uh, in the intelligence world, uh, less on the structure and more on the focus and what years and years of doing a specific kind of operation, and I would argue counterterrorism operations has been at the center of it, has changed intelligence and has changed spying. And so I thought I would open my talk by a, with an anecdote um, that gets at the beginning of this period uh, that is, I think, colorful, but also, I think, sets up where we are uh, going. And, and it's, an, it's an anecdote from right after the September 11th attacks and the, uh, everyone was in, it was chaos, and the CIA wasn't quite sure what to do, and, and the British came to visit, 
and um, it was this uh, s the spirit of the the special relationship, and and also there was a glimpse of, of what was to come. So I'll just read a, a brief passage from my book that talks about this. Um, mentions uh, uh, it focuses a, a man around a man named Sir Richard Dearlove, who was the head of MI6 at the time of the September 11th attacks. Sir Richard Dearlove saw a glimpse of the future just weeks after the September 11th attacks. The head of the Br British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, Dearlove came to the United States with other top British intelligence officials to show solidarity with the United Kingdom's closest ally. Dearlove arrived at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia to deliver the message personally that British spies were opening up their books, giving the CIA rare access to all the MI6 files on members of Al-Qaeda. The British had tutored the Americans in the dark arts during, the world, during World War II, but had long approached the spy game differently. In 1943, one member of Winston Churchill's special, special operations executive complained that, quote, the American temperament demands quick and spectacular results, while the British policy, just generally speaking, is long-term and plodding. He pointed out the dangers of the strategy carried out by the Office of Strategic Services, the CIA's precursor which relied on blowing up weapons depots, cutting telephone lines, and landmining enemy supply lines. The Americans had more money than brains, he warned, and the OSS's, quote, hankering after playing cowboys and Indians could only lead to trouble for the alliance. Dear Love had grown up in the classic British spying tradition. He would graduated from Queen's College at the University of Cambridge, a traditional recruiting ground for the British Secret Services, and had served in foreign postings in Africa, Europe, and Washington. Like his predecessors, as head of MI6, he signed all internal memos with his code name, C, which by tradition was always in green ink. Shortly after his plane landed, the plane carrying the call sign Ascot 1, landed in Washington, Dear Love found himself inside the counter-terrorist center at CIA headquarters. On a large screen, CIA officers were watching video of a white Mitsubishi truck driving along a road in Afghanistan. Dear Love had known that the United States had developed the ability to wage war by remote control, but he had never before watched the Predator drone in action. Several minutes went by as the Mitsubishi was framed by the crosshairs at the center of a video monitor, until a missile blast washed the entire screen in white. Seconds later, the picture clarified to show the wreckage of a truck, twisted and burning. Dear Love turned to a group of CIA officers including Ross Newland, an agency veteran who had months earlier had taken, taken the job as part of the group overseeing the Predator program. He cracked a, wa a wry smile. It almost isn't sporting, is it? This was the beginning of um, a, a real change in how the CIA did intelligence, how the United States looked at the role of the CIA. And I think it would become, be the beginning of what would be a complete reorientation of American intelligence and the intelligence establishment, away from a particular focus on traditional espionage, as it was practiced during the Cold War, toward a laser-like focus on hunting, tar targeting, capturing, and often killing. It's a story of the CIA at the front lines of what is a secret war, a war that's changed the nature of spying and that has had both good and bad consequences. It's changed uh, the focus of a CIA, which I, th I would argue the CIA has had the most profound change since 9-11 of all the intelligence services, uh, because they have been the ones put at the front of this secret war. And it's shaped the perspective of a whole new generation of intelligence officers. The CIA now has more than 50% of the agency are people who joined after the September 11th attack. So if you think about that, that is the majority of CIA officers are relatively young and are people who have known to, uh, uh, a mission where two successive presidents, one Republican and one Democrat, have given the CIA the first and foremost mission of counterterrorism, in other words, manhunting. It's changed the language of intelligence, the idea of what is a target in traditional terms. An intelligence target is someone you would target to turn into an agent for information. Uh, targeting becomes something much different in the post 9-11 era. Uh, targeting means someone who you were hunting um, either to interrogate for information or possibly to kill. Um, that distorts the idea of um, what an intelligence service um, should be for. 
So what I wanted to do was tonight talk about what, how we got to this point where we are today and then spend time tomorrow talking about, I think, where we're going uh, as best we can tell at this point. So it was, it was four years ago when President Obama in the second inaugural address said that a decade of war was coming to an end. What he was talking about was the public wars. He was talking about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, ones that he was hoping at the time to end. As we've seen, um, he's, that hasn't quite worked out as he planned. Um, and then in a speech that May, he said that this war on terrorism must end and that the government has to be more transparent about it. So this was May of 2013. And basically he was, trying to get to a point where the United States was not in the semi-permanent war that was all done in the shadows, one that was relying on the CIA, one that was relying on covert action and secret strikes. But we've, as we've seen, it's three years later, and the war continues, and there's little, indi indi little indication as of yet that this new era of transparency is dawning. We're not seeing less uh, really strong action movement by the government to declassify information or even declassify uh, the CIA or the special operation wing of the military, their role in wars in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Libya, in Syria. Um, the list goes on. Um, the tides of war that seem to be receding at one point have come back in. And so I think what, we've see, what we're seeing is that the secret wars that the United States and in particular the CIA have been waging for the nearly 15 years don't show any signs of ending. And this is going to have an impact on our intelligence service. And I'll get to that, I'll think a little bit tomorrow about where, about where we're going. So this war, and I talk about it as a shadow war, the war that's outside of the traditional war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's created a new model for how the United States go to battle. It's had benefits and it's had costs, um, but there's no question that it's short-circuited the normal mechanisms by which the United States as a nation decides to go to war. It's been carried out, as I said, uh, not in wars that we would, war zones we would traditionally see before, uh, during the Cold War, or even uh, in the post-9-11 era, like Iraq and Afghanistan. It's been waged, the laboratories for this experiment have been places like Yemen and Pakistan and Libya and East Africa. So what are some of the other characteristics of this war um, as I get into the details of it? Well, here's an interesting characteristic, I think, is that it, it is a war, even at the CIA, um, that has been run in large part by lawyers. Um, what the United States could and could not do in a war of this nature um, was largely a blank slate before the September 11th attacks. And the lines were then drawn by lawyers over time over the past 15 years. So some of the most momentous and arguably controversial decisions that have been made in the last 15 years, decisions about detention, interrogation, torture, surveillance, assassination, effectively were made because groups of lawyers got together and said, what could and could not be done? What did and what did not violate the law? We still have an executive order on the books banning assassination. But as we know, there's been hundreds and hundreds of CIA drone strikes killing specific individuals. And so there's had to be some line drawn about what does and does not constitute assassination, just like what does and does not constitute torture. So even at the CIA, um, for those of you, I, I know some of you, many of you in the audience have a, have a great deal of a background in uh, the intelligence world or how the CIA works, what we've seen is the CIA has grown not only um, in its analysts and its operatives, but in its number of lawyers who have had to make these assessments about what the agency could and could not do. It's had um, profound impacts, I think, primarily, and this is what I want to talk about most, is, as I would argue and have argued, um, is that it's blurred the line between the work of soldiers and the work of spies. And the shorthand, I think, um, you can look at it as over the last 15 years, the CIA has become more like the Pentagon, and the Pentagon has become more like the CIA. Um, and so let me explain that. And I think by explaining that, I want to talk a little bit about where things were on September 11th, 2001, in order to then sort of try to describe the changes. So. Uh, for the, 
CIA, those of you who know it, there is a history that is um, cyclical to some degree. The early decades of the CIA were intensely operational in terms of um, uh, in Europe, in South America, and uh, in Africa, covert actions, uh, coup attempts, some assassination plots that became uh, revealed in the 70s. Um, th this, this was an intense focus that in the 70s, uh, uh, most of this came to light in the church and pike committees. And this was a real revelation for Americans uh, about what the CIA had been doing. And uh, a really wrenching experience for people who had been in the CIA, had been not accustomed to much congressional oversight. And all of a sudden, on television, uh, all of the dirty laundry of the first three decades of ex its existence uh, were be was being aired. And this had an effect, um, a number, according to both memoirs and, and documents and a, a number of people I've spoken to from this period of the generation that came in after the church committee. Uh, that uh, those who came in in the late 70s uh, came in during this period when the CIA was trying to reorient, reorient itself uh, back to um, being a traditional uh, espionage service. Uh, not only the, er, the, the covert actions of the 70s, uh, of the early 50s and 60s, but also the Vietnam era. You saw this intense paramilitary focus during Vietnam. Um, those who came in after church were basically taught that the CIA should first and foremost be an espionage service, not a, para, not a paramilitary service. And um, many of them, many of those people took that, uh, that message very seriously throughout their career. And what happened was, that 20 years later, many of those people were then in senior jobs in the CIA uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when uh, a, new dawn, a new era dawned for the CIA. And that was, and specifically, a moment in the summer of 2001 when the CIA was handed this new weapon called the Armed Predator. The CIA had been watching the rise of Al Qaeda for a number of years. In Afghanistan, uh, Osama bin Laden had carried out a number of attacks up to that point, and the question was, how should the United States government respond? And the CIA had been able to penetrate Al Qaeda and the Taliban to some degree. They were able to find the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, but it was never in real time. And once they found him, they could never find a way to kill him. And there was never there was this question of did they even have the authority to kill him? Again, going back to this ban on assassinations that came in in 1976 under President Ford, could the CIA carry out an assassination to that extent? Would it even be an assassination? So there was this intense debate in the summer of 2001 when the military, which had developed an armed predator, um, basically handed the CIA this weapon, and the question was, was should the CIA take it up? And George Tenet recalls meetings uh, during that summer at the CIA where Basically, it boiled down to, we're spies, we're not assassins. Um, should we take up this new weapon? Should we take on this new mission? Shouldn't that just be the military's job? And it somewhat seems quaint now, but this debate played out right up until the September 11th attacks. In fact, on September 8th, 2001, there was a meeting at the White House about whether the CIA should use the armed predator and uh, go to Afghanistan in the, uh, with the aim of going to kill Osama bin Laden. And even years later, there is still disagreement about what was decided at that meeting. Uh, but what we do know is the September 11th attacks happened. And within six days, President Bush gave an authorization to the CIA, a secret finding to go around the world to capture or kill Al Qaeda operatives. Uh, a secret order that's still on the books today and is still basically the foundation of the CIA's mission, uh, even though those who did the 9-11 attacks are either mostly either dead or in jail, um, uh, that authorization has been expanded uh, to encompass um, all sorts of different groups and different people who have carried out different attacks. So that's really the foundation then for this new transformation by the CIA, which took up not only the predator, and the role of targeted killing. But as we know, in the early days, the early years, it was more of a focus on detention, interrogation, some would argue torture, with methods like waterboarding in secret prisons because there was no, uh, there was basically very little information about Al Qaeda. And the belief inside the CIA and the Bush White House was uh, you needed to use these extreme methods in order to get that information. But over time, 
I, I pointed to around 2004, uh, things begin to change where uh, uh, there's this, uh, this concern in the CIA about the methods they've been employing. There's an inspector general report about uh, some of the methods might have crossed across the line into war crimes, and there's a real shudder throughout the ranks of the CIA that once again the agency might be facing another period like the Church Commission. They would be the ones who would be um, uh, facing possible uh, uh, legal jeopardy for the methods they used. And it's uh, during that period, 2004 on, you see a shift. You see a shift away from interrogation and away from the use of the secret prisons uh, towards targeted killing um, as a method of, of counterterrorism. And it's something that the Bush White House embraced really wholeheartedly at the end of 2008. Uh, in the middle of 2008, the end of the Bush administration, and as we know, President Obama has uh, embraced as well. And so what we've seen during the Obama administration is an acceleration of that process of focusing on uh, paramilitary activities, counterterrorism activities, um, manhunting um, uh, in places where the United States is not officially at war, but where the CIA has this authority. So that's that's one half of the coin on how the CIA has become more like the military. I'll, I'll, I'll spend less time on the, on the military side, but I think it's important because, again, it's sort of the other half of this dramatic change since 2001. So 2001 happens, 9-11 and, uh, happens, and, and the Pentagon had been, the military had been structured very much like it had been for decades uh, with, a, with large uh, static armies built to fight uh, wars like the the um, the Gulf War in the early 1990s, and this really infuriated the, the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld because what he saw was uh, a military that uh, he saw an enemy that was not in wars where the United States had authorized the military was authorized to fight. Uh, so the question was, how could the military? How could he? the Secretary of Defense, run a war in places where the United States was not at war. Um, the CIA had the authorities to operate in these places, but the military didn't. So what he really pushed for in the years he was Secretary of Defense was to expand the Pentagon's authorities to operate clandestinely. Uh, some would say even covertly, arguably, to act more like the CIA did with its own authorities, to operate in deniable places, in places where the United States um, did not have to acknowledge it was operating. He expanded dramatically the role of Special Operations Forces, specifically Joint Special Operations Command, which is down at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. It's the Delta Force, it's SEAL Team 6, which was this small niche group that was really built to do hostage rescues, uh, very short operations over 24 hours. Basically, what he did was he, he created, he built this organization to fight large secret wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, across the border into Pakistan. And this became Rumsfeld's tool to create the military more like the intelligence services. So there's been a convergence over the last 15 years uh, between the military um, and the CIA um, and this blurring of the lines. And, I'll, and in, a, in a little while, I'll get to sort of where does this culminate. Um, but first of all, let's get it to where did this play out? Well, I think that the true laboratory for um, this convergence is Pakistan. And I think probably the most interesting, I think the most interesting setting for, uh, for this experiment of the last 15 years, partly because it created this dilemma for the United States government of a country that was officially an ally, um, and yet a country where there were questions about the loyalty of its leaders, the loyalty of its intelligence service, um, the ability of its government to deal with uh, terrorism threats going not only into Afghanistan, but to the United States. And so it presented this dilemma. And so I think that if you want to look at a place where this grand transformation has taken place, um, I think Pakistan is the most interesting place to look. And the arc of the relations with the United, between the United States and Pakistan um, follow um, a, 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 an interesting, although I think somewhat depressing, uh, trajectory. Uh, there were early on, uh, good relations, I would say, for what you could call them good relations between the United States and Pakistan and specifically the intelligence services of 
the United States and Pakistan, the CIA, no, namely, and Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI. There was a degree of commonality of what their mission was. Uh, there was no love for al-Qaeda among the Pakistani intelligence service, and there was a view that while the ISI had nurtured the Taliban and saw the Taliban as a bulwark in Afghanistan against India, um, al-Qaeda was a problem and a threat, and therefore they could work with the United States against al-Qaeda. So that, in the early period, netted a number, a number of successes. There were a number of senior al-Qaeda operatives captured in Pakistan, Abu Zubaydah, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, others. Uh, and that did show collaboration between the Pakistani and American intelligence services. But over time, uh, suspicion grew uh, about the motives, about each other's motives. The United States began suspecting that the Pakistanis were playing a double game, particularly with the Taliban, that while they were helping with al-Qaeda, they were secretly nurturing the Taliban uh, because uh, they were unclear whether the United States was going to stay in Afghanistan. The Pakistanis were unclear whether the United States was going to stay in Pakistan, uh, sorry, in Afghanistan, and uh, we're not sure whether, uh, as the United States got diverted to the Iraq War, whether uh, they should be nurture, continuing to nurture the Taliban uh, because they were looking at the long-term picture of uh, how the Taliban fit into their own strategic defense against India. So the mutual suspicions grew over time. Uh, to a couple critical points, and I think these points then accelerate these transformations uh, in the CIA that I talked about earlier. Um, the first is the uh, decision in some of July of 2008 by the Bush White House to basically conduct drone strikes in Pakistan unilaterally. Up to that point, there had been a decision uh, from 2004 to 2008 to uh, to get the Pakistanis to sign off on every drone strike, or at least notify them of drone strikes that had, were taking part in the, in, in the country. There became, came to be a belief inside the CIA and at the White House that uh, the Pakistanis were tipping off uh, militants uh, before the strikes, and uh, in 2007, there were no successful strikes. So there was this belief that, that, that perhaps uh, their partner uh, wasn't such a reliable partner. And so President Bush authorized, authorized unilateral action, and you see this dramatic spike in drone strikes starting in July 2008, and when President Obama comes in in January 2009, he makes the, I think, very fateful decision to it, it continue the program and in many ways even accelerate it from where Bush had left it, uh, leaving, um, uh, you're seeing in 2009 and especially in 2002, a dramatic increase in drone strikes based on intelligence that had been gathered by the CIA and its agents in the Pakistani tribal areas. So that had positive and arguably very negative results. Uh, one is that it did have a dramatic effect on al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda operatives uh, in terms of those who were killed uh, or who fled because of the drone strikes. But it also really poisoned relations between the United States and Pakistan uh, to the point that uh, th by th three years later, uh, was really uh, the cratering of the relationship. And I think this is one of the big points I think we want to look at uh, when we look at intelligence operations post 9-11, because there is so much of a focus on uh, what they call kinetic operations, uh, capturing, killing, uh, uh, operations inside countries where you may not acknowledge your role or you may not tell your uh, partner service, uh, it can have really deleterious impact on diplomacy, diplomatic relations between the countries. And so um, many people would think that in 2011, exactly five years, five years from Monday, uh, when the uh, Osama bin Laden raid happened, um, was the low point. But actually, I think uh, in traveling to Pakistan and doing a lot of reporting there, and as I write about in my book, the real I think the lowest point of the relationship came a few months earlier when a CIA operative named Raymond Davis was captured, uh, was, was picked up by policemen in Lahore, Pakistan, after he had shot two people he thought were go trying to, uh, trying, trying to, um, to rob him um, as he was driving through the streets of Lahore. Uh, Davis is picked up. Uh, uh, by the cops, uh, he had, uh, after he'd shot the two men, he had radioed for help. Uh, a 
police, a, a, a white van from the Lahore consulate in the United, the United States, American consulate in Lahore, came to go rescue him, but in trying to do so, it um, killed a third person by accident and then drove away and left Raymond Davis on the street uh, to his own devices. He's picked up, put in jail, and actually the, the beginning of my book is the, um, is the interrogation of Davis by the Pakistani police, which you can actually watch on YouTube, amazingly. Uh, and, um, and it set off um, this uh, period where President Obama had to uh, say publicly that he was not a spy, he was a diplomat. Uh, the Pakistanis knew better. And for the Pakistanis, this was a, uh, in their mind, proof about CIA operations uh, over the years, uh, that the CIA basically had deployed this secret army inside Pakistan without telling the Pakistanis that were up to, in their minds, all sorts of nefarious acts. And Raymond Davis sitting in jail in Lahore was the proof of that. Um, the end of the, uh, the, 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 the issue ultimately resolves when a deal was struck um, that the families of the victims were paid off. Raymond Davis was spirited out of the jail and put on a plane to Afghanistan and brought back to the United States. But that really soured the relationship um, really 10 years after 9-11, more even than what happened three months later when uh, a, a group of Navy SEALs went into Pakistan, deep into Pakistan, and killed Osama bin Laden. Um, but I think that moment, the bin Laden raid, I think kind of illuminates the transformation that I've been talking about. Um, here you had, 10 years after the September 11th attacks, you had a group of soldiers uh, operating under the CIA's authority with a sort of flick of a pen, uh, this, the Navy SEALs were given uh, authority to operate under CIA uh, rules, to operate inside Pakistan, a country where the United States was not at war. And if they, uh, if the Bush administration so choose, sorry, the Obama administration so choose, chose, um, they could have never acknowledged their role, never acknowledged the operation. Um, the, as we know, what happened in that operation, uh, it was acknowledged, it became what was considered the CIA's greatest moment since the September 11th attacks, but it does show a blurring of the lines of what had happened um, uh, between the United States military, the, its intelligence services, and how they'd converged um, in this country uh, that is officially an American ally. Um, I think that I will um, stop here uh, and then get tomorrow into um, where all this uh, is going and whether um, we are likely to see any change. Thanks. Thank you all. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you to the council for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to share this uh, podium with two very distinguished speakers on the panel. Um, I almost actually didn't make it today. Um, I flew in from uh, Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, where I teach uh, at uh, Coastal Carolina University, um, and uh, the flight was overbooked in typical fashion. Uh, I should not mention the, f the name of the company since we're on TV, you know, maybe, maybe I should for that reason. Uh, and almost did not make it on the flight, uh, but a very kind lady uh, stepped in and said, you know what, I'll, I'll, stay, I'll stay here tonight uh, so you can go to your conference. Because I said, you understand, I have to be at the conference today. And I was very thankful to her. And then she, she turned and around and asked me, um, so what's your conference about? And I said, it's about espionage. <laughs> and I think she got scared after that. <laughs> Which, which is sort of typical of, uh, of the subject, I guess. It happens a lot uh, when I tell people my sort of uh, academic interest, which is <clears throat> espionage. I have a discussion usually that ends at that point or dies, dies away. So it's, I'm glad to be uh, uh, with this audience that uh, hopefully this discussion will not, uh, this subject will not kill the discussion. In fact, it will probably fuel it. And I hope uh, also for tomorrow's discussion uh, to have some interesting uh, th thoughts and, and debates. My main area of expertise is espionage. Um, it's, uh, in fact, uh, technically speaking, we can call that human, human intelligence, right? Essentially, uh, a very quick definition of this 
is uh, human intelligence. Uh, any information that can be gathered from human sources using human sources is uh, basically what the CIA was initially founded to do before it sort of, sort of changed its mission, as Mark very correctly, correctly pointed out. Um, a few very basic uh, uh, aspects of the background of this uh, in the United States, there is a, a significant human element to the intelligence community. Of course, human is one of many uh, disciplines of intelligence collection. It's not the only one. But in the United States, uh, obviously, the Central Intelligence Agency is the agency that makes most use of human intelligence. Uh, it's one of the core missions of this agency. But it's not the only one. We have, of course, uh, of course the Defense Intelligence Agency that does more or less what the CIA does, except it focuses mostly on military issues as opposed to civilian issues. Um, the Department of State also makes use of that technically. I mean, they collect information from humans, using humans, although they're not obviously uh, an intelligence agency. They have an intelligence component, though, uh, for sure. And of course, uh, not to mention the, the FBI uh, makes use of human intelligence. And of course, uh, every, every, every branch of the US Armed Forces has uh, components that facilitate human intelligence. So it's a, it's a varied, scattered sort of discipline throughout the US intelligence community. The most esoteric of all, no question about that. Um, and that's the reason why I want to spend a, little, a few minutes just sort of um, going th into the background of this before I go into more detail. In the United States, um, since 9-11, um, <clears throat> uh, since we had, we've had a, a sort of reorganization of what we call the National Clandestine Service, uh, which is supposed to be actually the National Clandestine Service is supposed to be sort of a, 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 a sort of a unit that brings together the various human aspects of the U.S. intelligence community. And the reality is mostly run by the CIA, and so it's a CIA shop, really. Um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is supposed to supervise it, although there are a lot of issues there, a lot of turf wars of who actually is uh, in charge of the National Clandestine Service. It's so much part of the CIA that actually people often refer to the Director of Operations as the NCS, as the National Clandestine Service. There's a lot of confusion about this. But in fact, it's supposed to be bigger than just the Director of Operations, which is a part of the CIA that does the human aspect that I specialize on. If you look, if you would uh, reduce the size. Thank you. Yes, appreciate that. Um, according to the website of the Office of uh, Director of National Intelligence, the National Clandestine Service is supposed to serve as the, sort of the national authority for coordination Deconfliction, I love that word, right? Because it points to conflict in the US intelligence community and evaluation of clandestine human intelligence collection. That's really the mission of the, of the NCS. And of course, it's managed by the director of NCS as um, delegated by the director of the CIA, who is an undercover uh, officer. Now, uh, just a, a, very, a very quick and, but important note here about, uh, uh, about uh, human. Uh, typically, uh, operations officers that deal with human intelligence, right, they uh, don't kill people, <laughs> all right, typically. Uh, they don't uh, drive flashy cars. In fact, if anything, being flashy is looked down on uh, the work of an actual operations officer. They tend to blend in. They don't fre frequent casinos, unlike James Bond. Although there was a story recently about uh, the CIA recruiting or trying to recruit Chinese uh, officials in casinos in Macau. So it does happen sometimes, just not uh, very often. Um, and um, most important of all, uh, and I should also say, by the way, technically they don't spy, right? They don't themselves spy. They actually recruit others who spy for them. Um, so they're officers, not spies. Those that are their assets, their agents, are the ones that actually do the spying. Um, and most important of all, most of them have diplomatic immunity, right? It's an important, important subject. I'm going to return to this in a minute uh, of what that means in the sort of current era of asymmetric uh, war that the U.S. finds itself in. Most uh, operations officers that are involved in human intelligence collection, known also as uh, core collectors or case officers, what they do is they recruit people in foreign countries to spy for the United States government, right? This is a very complex and um, uh, difficult task that is based on very strong, of developing very strong relationships of trust 
between an operations officer and an agent. Uh, these agents then will, um, will trust you as an operations officer, as a case officer, to such an extent that they will actually go out there and put their lives at risk for a number of reasons, sometimes money or grudges against their own agencies or whatever, but often, to a large extent, they do it because of you. So psychology plays a very, very important role in this, far more important than guns and weapons, right? I would actually call this uh, the ultimate people job, right? You have to be very good at convincing people to do things for you that they would not otherwise do. So that's the important background to keep in mind as we discuss how this type of line of work has changed in the post 9-11 era in which we find ourselves today. <coughs> so the core collectors uh, for the US intelligence community, again core collector is another term we use for an operations officer that collects human intelligence. This is really the conventions that the US intelligence community uses to collect human intelligence is pretty much a Cold War phenomenon. They were developed during the Cold War. America hardly had an intelligence community to, be, to speak about, uh, to speak of before uh, World War II. Um, and so the conventions, the methods, the, the disciplines, the traditions in America of uh, human intelligence developed during the Cold War. So it is, strictly speaking, a Cold War phenomenon, right? And that typically involves, in the Cold War in particular, involved usually men, uh, usually from a middle class or upper middle class or upper class background, who join the CIA sort of word of mouth type uh, uh, um, uh, a system, which of course were not used to living in austere environments, were they? Because they came from quite privileged backgrounds. Not as much as the British uh, case, but still, there was an element of class in that recruitment. Uh, process. And so they were not used to living in very austere environments, right? And they spent, um, as a result, much of their career in quite, uh, I would say, for the most part, not always, safe, safe locations and doing things that were quite safe. They all had um, official covers, meaning that they had a position in the U.S. government that gave them diplomatic immunity, meaning that uh, they were often stationed in U.S. embassies or consulates in uh, countries around the world, right? And they, they, they pretended to be diplomats, many of them. Um, in fact, they were not. They were also diplomats, but in fact, their real job began usually at night when they did the they, they, uh, they, uh, human part of their, uh, of their job. Now, of course, um, they sort of, their life resembled very much of those of diplomats. At least it overlapped in certain, in many important areas. Um, diplomats often are known, for example, to attend cocktail parties at various embassies. That's a big part of the life of a diplomat. Every country has its national holiday and they host some kind of an event and you're supposed to go there and attend. Very often, particularly during the Cold War, what operations officers would do is attend those events and try to recruit other diplomats of other countries. And you do that kind of strange song and dance with them. And of course, they're doing the same to you, right? Because they also pretend to be diplomats, but they're not. And then you have to go back to your office and write a report about this, you know, and sort of like hope that something happens out of this, right? And often it does, sometimes it does not. But that's very often a very large um, part of an operations officer's life during the Cold War, right? These were mostly safe assignments. And I would say that they're safe even today. Um, you know, if you have immunity and you have a passport that says you're a diplomat, let's say you get caught spying in China, so you basically are exceeding the description of your diplomatic job, I mean, yeah, they might yeah, arrest you and maybe rough you up for a couple of days, but they can't really do anything to you, chances are. They'll let you go. Uh, the case of uh, Raymond Allen Davis that you mentioned uh, is typical of that. Even in that case, the guy was basically, uh, after he was roughed up for a few days, he got to come back home. These were very safe assignments. The, uh, as assignments uh, uh, go. In addition to that, and that's an important part of what I'm trying to say today, right? These uh, mostly men, mostly middle class or upper middle class individuals were trained to recruit people who looked and acted and often thought just like them, right? Even in the depths of the Cold War, right? Your average uh, Russian diplomat that you're trying to recruit, or a Polish diplomat, whatever it was, you know, for the most part dressed like you, sort of, you know, spoke English or something that resembled English or something like that, right? And for the most part, you could communicate. There was a, a, a con connection of cultures. 
They also had limitations to how far they wanted to go as part of the commitment to their principles, right? They would often not be a sort of suicide, uh, have a suicide mentality, uh, which is not the case today. Additionally, most of that work focused mainly on the USSR. It's actually amazing when you look at the uh, archives, the degree to which the United States focused on the USSR. Of course, it was active all over the world, but often that activity in same parts of Africa or Asia did revolve around what the Soviets were doing there. Right? I've written a sort of a documentary history of the National Security Agency, and one of the things that I found really kind of funny and interesting is that during the sort of the early 1980s, I believe, they had they had four different departments and sort of accounts, but they had two like basic uh, units. One was uh, Soviet, and the other was ALLO, L L L I A L L O, which meant all others, and that was pretty much it. Right? The amount of output, particularly when it came to human, that were dedicated to the Soviet Union was incredible. Right? And so if you look at the map of the world in those days, you know, let's say you're an uh, operations officer and you're, you know, you're involved in human, you'll be stationed somewhere abroad in a place like, say, Istanbul or Nairobi or Seoul or Helsinki or Berlin or uh, Vienna, the kinds of places that we, or Brasilia, you know, that we associate with kind of like the, the Cold War, as it were. And I have you know, these are nice places. Quite nice. I mean, if you're stationed in Vienna and you live as a diplomat, you get a nice house and a nice, you know, income. Even if you're in places like, like Nairobi, you live in the western area and it's so like leafy and gated, and you get a good income because it's so cheap to live there. You know, so it's great. You know, it's a very nice, safe type of life for an operations officer. You get to compare that with the types of cities that we associate with today's. Uh, current affairs. Uh, places like Juba, or Nouakchott, or Benghazi, or Peshawar, or Zamboanga. You know, the kind of things that when you type in Microsoft Word, it tells you that they're wrong. You know? These are the kinds of places we're talking about. The Cold War is over, and their focus has shifted. Right? And these places are not as nice. Are they? And so essentially, what we find ourselves in today is that the main problem we have, of course, is that I mentioned that uh, human, human intelligence operations were developed during the Cold War um, on state actors. Now we're dealing with non-state actors. And the way you collect human intelligence on a non-state actor is totally different than how you go about this with a state actor, right? No, to begin with, non-state actors do not display overt targets of human intelligence collection. They don't have diplomats. <laughs> they don't have b a business community or senior officials they can actually recruit. In fact, you rarely come in contact with them because they mostly operate underground. In addition to that, <clears throat> that forces core collectors to actually focus for a change on targets that are not diplomatic. You can't recruit anymore by going to cocktail parties and embassies. You can't recruit on people who live in the same neighborhood as you, who happen to be working for another country. This is over. Of course, we do that still. But what I'm saying is that the war on terrorism does not revolve around that kind of universe anymore. That is over. In addition to that, the, the actual terrain is alien. It's unfamiliar to Western operatives. Have you been to Yemen lately? You've been to a place like Sana'a or Shabam? It looks like an alien landscape. And I mean that in the sense of extraterrestrial. It reminds you of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the images from Star Wars, almost, right? Well, I even the architecture is different to what we are used to here in the West. Let alone the way people talk or the dress. You know, the linguistic issues are massive, right? The linguistic barriers, the cultural barriers are almost insurmountable, even today, many years after 9-11. That's a serious problem for human intelligence collection. Not to mention, of course, the very hazardous operational environment. I mentioned before, if you're caught in, even in Russia today, let's say, or Venezuela or something like that, I mean, you know, chances are nothing major is going to happen to you. I tell my students sometimes, if you want like, life-threatening situations, don't join the CIA, join law, law enforcement. You know? Local law enforcement, far more dangerous you know, than working as a typical case officer for the CIA, even a case officer, let alone an analyst, right? But in this case, if Al-Qaeda were to, 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 to arrest you, or ISIS, we're talking about a very, very 
uh, serious turnover first for you and for your account, right? Back in the CIA. I have a, a very poor, important uh, data point in my research, which comes from an article uh, written well, under this title, The Counter-Terrorist Myth, written by Mark uh, Gerecht, a former um, intelligence officer for the, uh, for the CIA. He wrote this in 2001 in July, um, and I think that's a very accurate picture of what was happening then at the CIA. This is a quote from his article in The Atlantic. The existence of a U.S. counter-terrorism program in the Middle East, South, and Central Asia is a myth, he says. It just doesn't exist. We don't have such a thing back in 2001. He said, it's virtually impossible for Westerners to operate in Al-Qaeda's environs. That's a good question, actually. What are the chances of, like, you know, a white Caucasian guy from America, you know, surviving in Peshawar for more than a week? Or even actually going unnoticed? That's impossible. Not in a place like Peshawar, or Sana, or Benghazi. This just doesn't happen. Um, the close, so, in, so that brings me to the point that these are, you know, often these places are terrorist safe havens. And these terrorist safe havens are very close, uh, have a very close structure, and it poses operational difficulties even for non-Caucasian Muslims, core collectors, which the CIA has, right? So what Gerecht is saying, and remember this is back in 2001, this is not necessarily today, right? 2001, around the time of the 9-11 attacks, is that even a CIA officer, a core collection officer who is a Muslim, who is familiar with the kind of culture, finds it very difficult to survive and to be convincing in a place like Peshawar or Benghazi. And so case officers, because of that, <clears throat> have, to, have to force themselves to venture outside of the diplomatic circuit, what, what, what uh, Gerecht is saying. Except uh, back in 2001, that was not necessarily encouraged, because it is dangerous, or in fact even rewarded. A great quote that he uh, has in his article from a former uh, division uh, operative uh, for the CF on Near East. Um, Sorry for the strong language, but this is so typically Director of Operations, right? I have to read it. The CIA probably hasn't got a single truly qualified Arabic-speaking officer of a Middle Eastern background who can play a believable Muslim fundamentalist who will volunteer to spend years of his life with shitty food and no women in the mountains of Afghanistan. For Christ's sake, he says, most case officers live in the suburbs of Virginia. We don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> That's a great quote. Another quote. Uh, this time from an active CIA case officer, operations that include diarrhea as a way of life don't happen. <laughs> and while we're on the subject, I would add to this, operations that include lack of toilet paper as a way of life don't happen either. Right? Uh, another thing that Gerecht says, I'm not sure I so much agree with that, but this interesting comment, we can discuss it perhaps, that human in the CIA is characterized by risk-averse bureaucratic nature which mirrors the growing physical risk aversion of American society. Interesting comment, even though, like I said, I'm kind of skeptical about that one. And um, I would add to this, this is not Gerek's point, this is my point, that often because of that, because it's difficult, it really is difficult, particularly for some of the older case officers who are trained in different like, uh, perspective to venture outside the safe Western areas, um, it's difficult. Uh, and they tend to fall into predictable patterns of behavior, for example, when meeting their agents, which makes them uh, very much a target of uh, foreign counterintelligence. This may have happened in Beirut. There was some reports in the uh, news that the CIA uh, uh, suffered a virtual wipeout of its um, agent network in Lebanon in Beirut in 2001. What had happened apparently was that you know, they would meet them at like, you know, the KFC, in Beirut or Starbucks because that's what they felt, you know, comfortable doing. Because that's like that you feel at home. Like it's not as challenging and dangerous. Well, all the Hezbollah had to do was monitor, you know, who was meeting in those places. It was like locals, you know. It's that simple, you know. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, how things have changed since 9-11. Um, so what's the way forward? What are the responses to the challenge? And again, this is Gerek's article written in 2001. What's happening now that we can point, of course, 
we don't have access to the inside picture, but we can speculate and also uh, use some um, open sources, uh, like for instance, Mark's book that he mentioned earlier. There is no question, of course, the CIA counterterrorism service is not a 9-11 creation. It was existed for decades before that. But we have seen an unprecedented growth of the center. It now it's so, uh, it's so big and so active that it rivals some of the traditional uh, national clandestine service accounts. Right? That is a result of the things that I've been just talking about. It's an outcome of that, a direct outcome. There is also um, a renewed growth in the CIA's non-official cover program, the NOX. The NOX, as uh, you probably have heard of this before. Uh, these are actual officers uh, who go out there who don't have immunity, who go out there and don't have a connection to the uh, government of the United States. So they do what others do under immunity without that kind of protection, which gives them more flexibility and, of course, bigger, a bigger pressure to operate within society as opposed to detached from society. That, of course, is very dangerous. Uh, there were about, <clears throat> there were hundreds of, uh, uh, there are hundreds today of CIA officers, some say over a thousand, we don't know for sure, but Knox have definitely seen a rise up from just a few dozen back in uh, the Cold War. So that's a direct result of this situation. And of course, um, we are perhaps, perhaps, this is more of a speculation on my part, and I'd like to see what others uh, here have to say about this. We may be noticing a post-global war on terrorism transition from tactical counterterrorism, the killing and the kidnapping and all that kind of stuff, back to strategic operations, uh, focusing more on human intelligence. Right? This, again, is a matter for discussion. I think this is happening, although we cannot be certain. Um, cannot be certain. And this is something, again, part of my speculation, and it kind of connects to what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. We may be seeing a, a possible future emphasis on case officers specializing more. In other words, instead of having somebody spend, like, you know, do operations in 30 different countries in their career, it may be narrowed down to two or three which means that they go more in depth, they culturally become more aware, linguistically more aware, and more able to operate in these kinds of environments because that is all they do. Right? But again, that's more of a speculation, I think, and based on my sort of, uh, sort of uh, I guess, sixth sense and also research, that this is where things are going toward. But I will mention more about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Until then, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation, all three of you. Uh, we have time for Q&A, and uh, please raise your hands and stand up when you take the mic and ask short and pertinent questions. Thank you. Uh, the... Back in 1971, during the, uh, where West Pakistan became Bangladesh, there was that whole conflict, and the United States backed uh, Pakistan, which many people say was the wrong thing to do, but even though this was 30 years before 9-11, uh, when it was mentioned that at first, the United States and Pakistan had reasonably good relations. Even though it's 30 years before, was the United States role in the Bangladesh uh, conflict uh, a good example of that? I, I, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit about it. I'm not an, an expert in, 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 in that conflict. I, recommend a terrific book called The Blood Telegram about that conflict. Um, but, it, but it gets to the point, um, the author's name, a, a guy named Gary Bass, who's a professor at Princeton. Um, but it, you're right, the United States backed uh, Pakistan uh, in uh, putting down that, um, uh, the, 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 the insurrection in Bangladesh. There's all sorts of cables and, and uh, documents about Henry Kissinger's role in that. Um, the larger point is that Pakistan was seen as a 
uh, a very important Cold War ally for the United States, um, where it was seen that India was in the uh, sort of in the Soviet sphere, and some of my colleagues might be able to speak more intelligently on this than I do, but but Pakistan certainly. Uh, and then moving forward, you obviously have um, the very important role the United States and Pakistan played in the arming of the Mujahideen in the 80s uh, to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Um, it was very, very uh, important alliance until the end of the Cold War. Uh, during the after the after the the fall of communism, there was a drift in the relationship. Uh, there was an estrangement to some degree. The uh, the United States got a little bit closer to India. The uh, Pakistanis, uh, af after the Soviets left Afghanistan, uh, the, the Taliban came about. They, uh, as I said earlier, cultivated uh, the Taliban as an important ally against India. And so what we had on you know, 2001 and 9-11 was an old ally that was certainly not it was certainly not the same level of trust as there had been in the, in the Cold War, um, but it was still seen as um, uh, uh, a country that had drifted from the United States' sort of same interest, but it was still quite important. And if I could just quickly add, on um, the Soviet records pertaining to the separation of Bangladesh from Pakistan in 1971 just became available um, last August. And, I, and again, because they were only so recently available. I haven't gone through all of them, but I did look at some of them. And because, as Mark mentioned, India was a close ally of the Soviet Union, the um, Soviet uh, uh, intelligence service and Soviet foreign ministry were basically um, quite happy about the outcome in the um, that. Uh, Bangladesh had be, been able to be separated through Indi India's intervention and saw this as a new arena in which there would be possible opportunities for intelligence gathering vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, which it was looked on as an important U.S. base for espionage. Yeah, just quickly a question for Mark. Uh, you called this a lawyer's war. Uh, do lawyers ever say no? <laughs> Do they ever say, you know, when the services want to torture, when they yeah. want to? Uh, you know, do various things that are on their operational agenda that, you know, the lawyers say, no, you can't do this. You know, if you could talk about examples of that. And then a quick question for Joseph. Uh, specialization, you ended with that now? Uh, you know, that is in the sense, uh, you know, haven't we been doing this? Aren't there people who've been working on, beha on you know, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, you know, with, and, you know, have sort of dedicated their career and, you know, their, their specialization to those sorts of things? You see that that is a way of the future. Isn't this what's happening now? I, I'm kind of hoping that it is. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, quickly, the... Um, Yes, they say no. <laughs> um, the uh, the most famous examples, of course, um, are those of when they when they've said yes, when they were presented a sort of list of things that the agencies wanted to do, and the lawyers basically found ways to justify them, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, the interrogation, whether it's surveillance, whether it's uh, you know, the, the famous or infamous decision to uh, target uh, an American citizen, Anwar Awlaki, in 2011. Um, so those are more famous. There are certainly examples, though, of uh, lawyers, w once some decisions were made or in the midst of some of the decisions, um, resisting that mo that pressure. Uh, there's a man named Alberta Mora who was the, I believe, um, I, I could be wrong, the general counsel of the Navy, I believe, in the Pentagon, uh, who was resisting some of the interrogation methods at Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere. Uh, he famously was a dissenter from some of that movement. Uh, there's a, uh, a lawyer for the Justice Department of the Bush administration, Jack Goldsmith, who wrote a book uh, about uh, how his, his role in rescinding some of the orders given uh, specifically on surveillance uh, the for infamous uh, NSA wiretapping. So, so some of those lawyers uh, are known now. It, they are um, uh, sort of 
famous in some circles, uh, but it is, I think, just telling that some of the, it, it's, it, it's, I think, fascinating that some of the most Im uh, important figures of this period uh, in this clandestine conflict are the lawyers for, on either side. Yeah, thanks for the question about specialization. An excellent question. Um, I will say that um, you're right. There is specialization, let's say, in the intelligence community of the United States. Um, a lot more specialization than in the analysis aspect. So, for instance, you know, there is somebody, I can assure you, that right now there is somebody at the CIA who specializes in the history of Albanian agriculture. And they're waiting for you to ask them. Like, they're living in some kind of cubicle somewhere, and their whole life comes to the moment where somebody's going to come down and ask them about this, right? So this, this does happen. However, in the operations department, not so much. Uh, if you look at, say, you just look at uh, the biographical sketches of retired operations officers. They say they've run operations in 30 countries, okay? Uh, my uh, sense is that this is going to become, this number is going to be reduced significantly in the years to come, right? So analysis, yes. Operations, I think not so much. Thank you. Thank you for everybody on the panel for tonight and look forward to tomorrow. Um, we've got two marks, so I'll start with New York Times, Mark. Uh, um, talk about the extent to which the technology got the policymakers, whether they were Republican administrations or Democrat administrations, off the hook. You can fire a hellfire from a predator, but you can also fire it from an F-16 or an, an, an Air Force platform. So talk about the extent that the technology made it easier or easy to pursue a policy of targeted killing and perhaps was a substitution for a more nuanced policy. And then just on the point of the lawyers, there have always been lawyers in the intelligence community. Donovan was a lawyer in OSS. Colby was a lawyer. Casey was a lawyer. So that tradition has always been there. But I agree, it's become a much more legalistic process. But for everybody on the panel, talk about the impact of the technology on the policy versus the policy on the technology. Sure, I'll start. That's it's a terrific question, and 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 right. There's there's obviously always been lawyers. They've had a role. The point I was making was the that that basically um, all of these decisions that were made after 9/11. There was really very much um, a, a blank slate that had to be filled in by lawyers on what could or could not be done. Um, it's an excellent point on the technology, right? What is the difference between uh, a uh, predator shooting a Hellfire and a F-16? The answer is the what the what the predator did was it allowed um, the agency or whoever was flying it to sit at one spot for a long period of time and watch. And there were, I don't think I said in my my opening talk, there were unarmed predators before there were predators, right? The, uh, armed predators. There were predators that just did surveillance. And the problem that came about was they flew the predator in 99 and 2000 in Afghanistan, and some CIA officers uh, are convinced they saw Osama bin Laden um, watching uh, the, with a predator. It was an unarmed predator. The question was then what to do, uh, and, and, and if they were going to kill him, did they have the authority, A, and B, was there the technology to do it? They would have to launch a, um, you know, a, a cruise missile from a submarine or something, which takes time, and he might have gone. So the, what the technology allowed, and I think you've got a great point, that it drove policy. It allowed them to sit there for a long period of time to watch, and then when they saw to make a decision and to carry out a kill. So um, it is, uh, the technology I think then was very seductive for policymakers uh, to do what they thought they couldn't do before. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, curious as to um, what you find with regards to the Cold War with um, false flag operations. So you have Operation Northwoods, Gladio B operations, and especially Mark uh, Kramer, maybe you could comment as far as what information has come out with regards to uh, the documents from the Soviet Union um, and them doing false flag operations or contemplating it? Like, you know, Operation Northwoods was never carried out, but it was planned. Um, to, let, let me, if I could just ask for a clarification. By falsifying operations, you mean operations that... Please, if Oh, okay, false flag. I'm sorry, I thought you said falsify. Um, false, um, I mean, covert operations were a staple part of Soviet foreign intelligence activities. They, um, they had many that uh, were designed for assassinations. They carried out assassinations um, 
both in within the Eastern Bloc, but also in Western countries and, and in Third World countries. Um, they, but the uh, there were efforts certainly to deceive and to present something as uh, being Western front, whereas in fact it was Soviet operated. Um, the uh, the records on this are still, you know, many of them are still sealed, at least in Russia, and so it's it's hard to give a sense of the full magnitude of it, but. Um, but intelligence gathering was the core of the mission of the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service, and the covert arm, the um, the uh, what in uh, in Soviet parlance were called wet operations, mokrya dela, um, were important in various eras, but in, in especially the Stalin era. But I think it would be misleading to say it was a dominant element of the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service. It, it was an important part, but the bulk of personnel went into uh, intelligence gathering and as more straightforward espionage. Um, just recently, and I think actually this was in the uh, New York Times Sunday Review like a week or two ago, um, there's this um, author who's uh, doing a biography of James Jesus Angleton, and he commented about how the CIA had essentially um, pulled, uh, learning that again, he was doing a biography of him and wanted to look at certain archival stuff that was supposed to be available to anyone, and the CIA essentially pulled everything when he went, at, you know, when he went to the archives and they said, oh, they're they've taken everything. Uh, so I wonder, I guess it's probably for Dr. Kramer again, uh, if you could talk about uh, reclassification essentially, of, and again essentially intelligence agencies hiding their dark secrets through this. Well, uh, again, it, it varies. Um, the, uh, what was the operations directorate of the CIA it was specifically exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. So you can apply for, uh, FOIA requests are very common for CIA materials, but that part of it is not subject to it. And for understandable reasons, the, um, you don't want to disclose agent names inadvertently and potentially endanger people's lives or at least safety. So the, um, there are bound to be gaps in that regard. The, I would say, though, overall, at least with respect to Cold War era records, the CIA has become vastly more open than it was. The, um, the, the electronic reading room, for example, would have been inconceivable during the Cold War. And there are tens of thousands of documents up there and a very good search engine that you can use. So. Um, the, there is reclassification of some U.S. materials. It pertains mostly to nuclear weapons related materials and that came about as an act of Congress. It was um, something that I think was unnecessary. It uh, also has been a real burden on declassification. So there are certainly major problems in the declassification pro process with regard to U.S. documents, but it's in that sphere. The, um, the exemption of certain parts of the U.S. intelligence community I don't think will change in the near term, even about Cold War era records. There is a great deal of reluctance to change it, both on the part of the intelligence community and on the part of the Congress. Um, I had a question, and it has to do more with uh, psychology and the American Psychological Association. About last year, uh, there was a big revelation that they were kind of in cahoots with the CIA and a bunch of the uh, top heads in the APA eventually fell, but the APA kind of came about uh, real heavily right after World War II when you had a lot of these veterans dealing with PTSD. and the APA, I guess, had a very strong relation with the military right after that. And then there's a bunch of operations people have probably read and studied about and so forth. But how does the concept of terrorism and that fine line between what is moral and what is ethic, ethical in terms of not just legal, but just what is humane? And there's always this fine line between it, but then you have the APA crossing over 
um, and pretty much advising them on how to extract information um, on what are the lines between it and how to play with someone's mind. And it was very interesting that they came uh, that came out, and uh, several of them um, fell from their positions. But it almost seemed like a lot of them had been involved in that community for a very, very long time. Since human intelligence is a lot of it's based on psychology. Um, is there any more about that? Because that's kind of a real gray, shady area. A lot of people don't have a lot of information about. But I found it was really interesting um, when that came out last year. I will say very briefly that I think the the connection between um, psychologists, psychiatrists, the U.S. military, and the CIA is much longer than you make it out to be, in my opinion. If you think the recent stuff with uh, um, enhanced interrogation is controversial, just look at MK Ultra. I mean, um, speaking of <laughs> missing documents, by the way, um, and uh, that's a it's a much more um, aggressive, invasive program. Uh, far less uh, supervised than the current uh, con controversy with the, the APA. I think also a lot of it to do with fear. Um, I think the 9-11 actually caused a tremendous amount of fear um, on Americans and it actually also um, influenced many academics in the academic community who perhaps became a little less um, careful about the fine line you're talking about than they should have been. Right? since um, Joseph mentioned about MK Ultra, and uh, as he also alluded to, that was um, a, a, a very strange operation of the, or the uh, activity of the CIA that was disclosed in the mid-1970s, and in which records were deliberately destroyed to try to cover it up. It turned out there were copies of some of those records that were subsequently obtained and made available. It, it is quite depressing to read that the CIA was engaged in that kind of activity. There were, again, these were some of the psychological exper um, experiments. The, uh, the, uh, there were also LSD experiments and others. Those were, when those were disclosed, they became extremely controversial. And as far as we know, uh, there has not been a return to that kind of activity. Uh, yes. Uh Dr. Fasanis, just one thing quickly. Uh, Matthew Gannon was a friend of mine, close friend, and uh, he was a case officer in the 80s, worked for the counterterrorism agency. He was probably one of the most fluent people in Arabic. He worked in Yemen, in Lebanon. He was killed in 1989. Um, there are other people, I don't know Russia, I understand the Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe, they also had experts, but uh, um, Bob Baer, Bob Ames. So I think you're a little incorrect in your uh, statements uh, about uh, generalization of case officers. And I just want to point out that, uh, again, Matthew died in 1989, and a lot of people are very upset about that. Um, uh, I, I worked for, um, I worked for, um, as a low-level person for General Hayden uh, uh, when he was at Fort Meade. General Hayden would say, Mark, he would say that he was very active in um, full intelligence, in interrogation, um, in surveillance, in a full intelligence types of aspects to end Al-Qaeda by a full intelligence. When he left in 19, uh, when he left in 2009, Obama and Panetta changed that, and they essentially went towards um, towards targeted assassinations, tr saying that essentially the way to get rid of Al Qaeda was not through a general intelligence method, but was through getting rid of its leadership. And uh, w would you agree or not agree with that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and then whoever wants to question it. I would. I'd agree partly. I mean, I, I think that Hayden uh, was given, you, you know, you said his background was in signals intelligence. Uh, he ran the NSA. I think he came to the CIA with a view of, um, of, of seeing, as you said, all aspects of intelligence. He got, and by his own admission, very, very deep into the counterterrorism world. And he was even the one who 
went to the White House in July of 2008 to advocate for this accelerated targeted killing program that the Bush administration picked up and as you said, Obama and Panetta ran with. So um, I do think by the end uh, of his tenure at the CIA, Hayden uh, really began something that Obama picked up on and Panetta picked up on. Thanks for your question and, and also for trying to say my last name, that was very brave of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks for giving me the chance to clarify. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's unfair to actually characterize everyone in that, uh, in that light because there is, there is a long tradition in the CIA of very risky operations conducted by very risky uh, case officers. I mean, we had people in the 80s in Beirut, for goodness sake. There were people in the Congo in the 60s. There were people in, you know, in uh, very difficult environments and often paid with their lives for that. My comment is that uh, and, and there were also people who did resemble James Bond, Vasek like American and people like that, you know, in the Soviet uh, desk and so on and so forth. So th this stuff did happen. I'm just saying that, and if you go even further back in the OSS days, it was even more of that, right? My comment is that during the Cold War, the majority of people involved in this kind of business uh, were kind of playing it kind of safe, not necessarily because they wanted to, but often because they had to. And so the culture um, was more toward that, uh, as opposed to the more risky operations that you're very correct, cost many uh, sea officers their lives uh, very often. So yeah, thanks for your comment and question. Yeah, time for two more questions. Um, Mr. Fitsnakis, um, you spoke about the CIA officers uh, changing and basically pushing the envelope of how they collect intelligence. Uh, you spoke about how uh, most of them never lived austere lives, uh, uh, grew up as uh, white privileged Americans. Um, I would like your opinion on uh, if you look at the case of Boy Bergdahl, he spent several years uh, as a prisoner uh, learning the culture and living the culture, and he would seem to appear as one of the uh, best recruits to become a CIA case officer. Um, I was wondering if your opinion is that the CIA would push the envelope that far to uh, get their officers that in depth and to get that knowledge? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, the, how, you know, basically what you're saying is how do you correct uh, the current deficiency? And I will say that there's been a lot of steps taken toward that direction. Um, I will say that the CIA in particular has done uh, great strides to diversify its uh, director of operations, uh, not just with uh, the aspect that you just mentioned, but also people who have um, a foreign, some kind of foreign background have lived abroad, uh, speak fluently a foreign language. It's more difficult to recruit these people because of the uh, uh, difficulty in assessing their background. So say, for instance, if you were born in Holland and your mom is Dutch or something like that and your dad is American, you, you grew up in Holland, speak fluent Dutch, moved to the United States, great uh, uh, background for the CIA, but they have to investigate your background. So they have to go to Holland. Or if, you say, you were born in Pakistan, or, you know, it makes it more difficult. Often people who apply for these jobs get tired of waiting and then move on to jobs that are easier to get and pay more as well. Another thing, yeah, they're less dangerous too. So you have to really want to, you know, to, to, uh, to work for that in that kind of line of, of work. And, um, I mean, very often the CIA, when they hire people, they will sort of make uh, two or three conditional offers for one position, knowing that two of the people that actually get an offer will eventually drop out because they're tired of waiting or they find something else to do. You know, so it's a very difficult. It's a very difficult job. It's more mud than metal, so as has correctly been said, uh, and and that's just one example of how how hard the situation is, how difficult. Thank you for your question. I suspect you you all use the unfortunate phrase rather than saying reorient. You should probably say reemphasize or change the emphasis. How much does the CIA still? I mean, my, my, maybe there's a few old men and women. Who still? How much does it still worry about the threat of Russia and China, which is still major, uh, major, major threat? Very good question. The uh, I think part of the problem with the um, the reorientation of the CIA, especially after 2001, but to some extent when the Cold War ended in general, was a is uh, as. Um, as we've all talked about, during the Cold War, CIA was overwhelmingly focused on the USSR, and, and understandably so. 
But, um, but when the Cold War ended, and particularly when the uh, war on terror began, it moved so drastically away from focus on Russia that I think it lost um, its ability to conduct operations and to even to conduct basic analytical work about it. There's still very good people there who deal with Russia and who are experts in Russia, but it's drastically shrunk from what it was. And I think now that Russia has be, is seen as much more of a threat over the last couple of years, particularly because of its, its um, activity, military activities in Ukraine, is that there will be some rectification of that, that there will be more effort and more personnel devoted to trying to understand Russia. Yeah, hey, okay. Thank you. So did you have something? Just really quickly, but you know, it takes time, and and uh, as Mark said, if you focus on it now, it takes years to develop expertise, and also if you're talking about human intelligence, penetrating Russia, Putin's inner circle, figuring out their intentions, so it, it will take a while, even if they're doing it now. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Please return tomorrow at 1 p.m., and we will continue. You're watching American History TV all weekend, every weekend on C-SPAN 3. To join the conversation, like us on Facebook at C-SPAN History.